Hello and welcome to Dr. Neurosaurus. Today's Paleo Spotlight is Dr. Shana Monteneri. She's a paleontologist who recognized a drive within herself to focus on science communication rather than research or teaching. After receiving her PhD, she completed a number of internships and a program in journalism and now uses her scientific background to report on neuroscience. Let's dive right in. Shana, welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, so you and I both did our training with Dr. Mark Norell at the American Museum of Natural History, which is why, why and how we know each other. Um, it's been a long, wonderful friendship. Um, and you have sort of recognized in yourself this not switch of career, but this desire to do something different with your paleo education. Um, tell us, tell us how your career has blossomed over the years. Yeah, there's, I'll try to keep it short because it's kind of a long story. I often tell people I've tried many different jobs. Uh, you know, uh, once you start in academia, I've tried like many of the different jobs you can do after. And, you know, I think I finally found the right one for me. Um, Right. Like you said, we met at our graduate school program in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. And I mean, I finished my PhD 11 years ago. So that was a long time. And so I was really young is the point. Not, you know, I mean, I'm still young, but I was really young at the time. I had just, you know, I went to undergrad for three years only. And then I decided I want to go to grad school. And so I was just really interested in learning more. And I didn't quite think, oh, like, what am I going to do after? You know, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be a professor or what I'm going to do. So, you know, I was kind of learning about different options when we were in graduate school. And I realized, you know, I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this, you know, go the academic route and focus on very specific research questions for the rest of my career. And so I thought, you know, what's what's a way that I can learn about a lot of different topics? Like it, being at the museum where we were doing our graduate school, you learn about so many different things, not just paleontology, if we're focused on paleontology, because our degrees were in biology, um, you know, learn about all different fields of natural history and geosciences and, and different, you know, m learn about mammals and reptiles and invertebrates and genomics. And so I was like, there's so many interesting stories out there. I don't want to just focus on one thing. So, you know, I, I kept at once finishing the PhD. I, I did um, a couple postdocs and, you know, did some teaching and I really enjoyed that. I did enjoy teaching. And then I did a research postdoc and I did, I enjoyed that, but I thought, and that was when I was like, you know, I really want to try writing because I'd had the opportunity to work on a couple blogs. It was like the heyday of blogs. Um, you know, blogs were really popular science blogs specifically, like not on journalism websites necessarily, just people writing science blogs were really popular I'd say between like 20, actually even like 2008 probably. And then they kind of fell off around like 2015 or 16. So like there was these years where, you know, a lot of scientists had their own blogs and a lot of researchers wrote blogs. And so yeah, I had an opportunity, actually had an opportunity to do one for a scientific journal, had a paleontology blog and that was fun. And then I had an opportunity to do it for a bigger news outlet called Forbes, which it was sort of like my own paleontology news blog that was for the public. And I was like, this is really fun. So I used that to apply for an internship um, that is for people who are doing a degree in science, basically, to get scientists to learn more about the media. And it's called a mass media fellowship um, from a group called the, you know, the AAAS who publishes science. And, it's, and so they do a lot of great job programs and everything. So um and yeah, and so I got this internship at National Geographic, and that was a probably a game changer. I remember being there on the first day, being like, "This is this is really fun." Like, I love that I could just think of a story, read a paper, and write about it, and then people will read it. And of course, I was writing for one of the most popular news websites, like in the world, um, especially for paleontology and natural sciences and natural history kind of stuff that we're interested in. So I was immediately like, "This is really fun." Um, I decided that I wanted to learn more about journalism since we went to school for biology and I got a master's in investigative journalism at Arizona State University in Phoenix. And yeah, that really, I, you know, anyone can be a journalist. Like you don't have to go to journalism school. A lot of great journalists that you read in the New York times, never don't have a degree in journalism, didn't go to journalism school. 
Um, but of course, knowing about the practice of journalism is helpful in being a journalist. Also, I've been a movie reviewer, I've reported on food, outdoor recreation and tourism, <laughs> business. <laughs> I've really, and then COVID, you know, during COVID, a lot of us journalists all ended up reporting on something to do, uh, wrote, you know, a number of stories about COVID too, because everyone had to write about COVID. So, yeah. And so now I've ended up on the next stop of my journey is like, I write now technical science, pretty technical science um, coverage about neuroscience that's meant to be a publication for neuroscientists. So it's not necessarily for the general public to learn more about the brain. Although if you would like to read it, I think um, there are people who would definitely understand a lot of it and there are certain stories they would understand a lot of, but um, yeah, it's really for neuroscientists in the field to learn more about what's going on in their field. So you've done a lot of <clears throat> writing in different, writing for different audiences. So in yes. <laughs> your early career, you did a lot of writing for scientists and now you're doing a lot of writing for the public and, and then this new kind of in-between um, sort of publication. How is writing for scientists different from writing for the public? Yeah, writing writing for scientists in a in a way that's like journalistic is actually kind of hard, I think. I think it's been more challenging than I I don't know. I thought it would be maybe because like I'm a scientist, so I do understand what scientists know and what they don't know, but then it's like when I'm covering neuroscience topics, I don't really know a lot about the topic. So you know, it's to strike that balance between what someone reading it would definitely know, like, oh, that's something you learn in like neuroscience 101. Um, you don't need to explain that versus like, oh, this is actually like a lot of neuroscientists don't know about this. You should explain it. Uh, because in you know, neuroscience is a huge field. I mean, it's huge. The, the annual meeting that's held once a year is draws upwards of 30,000 people between 25 and 30,000 people. So this is like a huge, huge, huge audience, uh, potentially of people. So it's like, obviously they don't know everything about everything. And much like paleontology, you know, I, I try to remind myself that, you know, what I studied looking at the, you know, chemical compositions of dinosaur teeth, for example, and dinosaur eggshells, like there are paleontologists who have no idea about how I did that. And meanwhile, I have no idea what they're doing. There is common ground, but like, you do still need to explain certain things, but you can kind of do it in a way that, um, you don't need to worry about making it like super simple that like anyone can understand, but maybe that like a neuroscientist can understand. So yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely different. Um, but it's a cool career. I think if you're interested in science to get into, because like you still get to read all the latest research, um, and talk to scientists, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely different, but in different types of stories too. Um, you know, the general public kind of wants to know, like, oh, there's a new discovery. That's neat. What does it mean for me? And, you know, when I'm writing for a neuroscientist, I don't necessarily need to say, what does it mean for me? It's like people just want to know about the science of it. You wouldn't necessarily see that in, like, you know, the Wall Street Journal, probably. Um, but it's like, that's something that scientists are interested in, though. How did getting such an intricate background in biology help you achieve these goals and help you um, have a better sense for how to write for these audiences. I think if you want to be a science journalist, um, having a degree in science is like sort of a, a necessity because, you know, you need to understand how to read academic papers, you know, a, a paper, peer reviewed paper is always going to be something that you need to understand. Um, and that's going to come up a lot in your reporting. And of course, there are journalists who are able to figure that out. But just knowing um, how to do that ahead of time is like really helpful. I mean, because it's a skill that takes, you know, years, I think, for you really to fully understand and think like a scientist. And that always just helps you understand what questions to ask researchers, how to frame a story, Um so yeah, I think getting a, get, I mean, specifically for me, a biology background actually has been really helpful, but I think it helps if you want to do any form of science writing, like biology life's, you know, you can be a life sciences writer, you can write for, it helps you write for pharmaceutical companies, need writers, um, nonprofits. It's just like, it's a great background to have. You mentioned how, you know, you've, you've been writing for a neuroscience journal for a year. So it's not, it's not that you don't know anything about neuroscience, you know, 
some about neuroscience and it's really funny to me in all of these conversations I've had with different scientists that the the concept of knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know is so (laughs) inherent to science that all of us all of us scientists are like well I spent you know x number of time x unit of time learning about this so i know some of it but i don't know everything as yeah, if as if is. anyone is capable of knowing everything about yeah. any topic and as i explained i was like yeah there's many neuroscientists who have completely i mean completely unrelated research from each other like completely completely i mean they're effectively like subfields within neuroscience that are just you know they don't really cross over. They're completely different. There's computational neuroscience. And, you know, then there's people who study Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration. And there's people who study different parts of the brain to see like how to na- how do you navigate around space. Like these, these are all pretty different things. Although there is some overlap between neurodegeneration and spatial navigation. But like, you know, I mean, a lot of it's like, you don't, nobody knows everything. But yeah, I think coming from a science background, I'm just like, oh yeah, there's so much I don't know. So then I would say, oh, I don't know at all. A good place to be, <laughs> knowing yeah. some but not all, and knowing what you know, and knowing what you don't know, it's very important. Yeah, yeah, especially no. if you're reporting on it. A lot of you'll hear people say, "Oh, reporters think they know they know everything about this." It's like I'm the opposite. I think a lot of science journalists are like, "I don't, I don't know everything about this." Yeah. What advice do you have for people interested in getting into science communication or science journalism? And the best part about journalism and communication, like I said, there's no credential for it. You don't have to pass a test or have a requirement of some like some sort like you can just do it and a lot of people do just do it and you know you want to um hopefully be giving your audience good information so you like do research before you go out there and start doing it there's obviously a lot of, of journalists out there but the landscape of journalism is changing not for the better in some cases in that like this year there's been 20,000 or so layoffs in the industry and a lot of science journalists have been laid off. And being laid off does not mean you're not doing a good job or people aren't reading this. But um, I mean, you just have to like, yeah, practice. You know, if you're in school, write for the school newspaper, or write for the school magazine, do that in middle school and high school. Definitely do that in college if you can. Look for internships. You know, if you have a local newspaper talk to journalists there. I mean, you can, I mean, there's no barrier on who can contribute to a a local publication, right? Even if you're in high school, you can do that. I was just reading Stephen King's um, writing memoir he has about writing. It's called On Writing. And he was writing sports news when he was in high school, like the newspaper, like hired him to write. And he wasn't even that great of a writer at that point. He was good. He's talented, but not like famous, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot of high school students actually end up contributing to the local newspapers if they're like really into it. So, you know, you just have to kind of seek out opportunities because it's a competitive field because there's just a lot of people and not as many jobs anymore. And, you know, that will probably change like everything does and go in cycles. There's a lot of scientific communication jobs that are, you know, maybe writing about science and writing about research for universities or for nonprofits or for botanical gardens or zoos or museums. Um, So if you're, you know, flexible they'll always there will be some job for you but it might not be like oh i'm gonna be a science reporter at the new york times because a lot of these places don't even have science reporters anymore unfortunately um but science communication is still uh, i think a really important field because like i said you know when there's serious things happening that are science related you need people who can explain it really well and people who are educated in science who can are also interested in writing they can do that (laughs) Um, I think you hit on something really important. I think no matter what your goals are as, you know, as an interested person is to create your own opportunities because a lot of the time it feels like people get these amazing opportunities, you know, for one reason or the other, but a lot of the time it's because they're self-driven and they, you know, people go out and find these opportunities for themselves and take advantage of it. So even if it's something that you're not finding success in, there are ways to create your own opportunities, um, no matter the field and no matter what the specific goal is. So I think that's something to keep in mind. It's like so much easier to contact people now who can probably help you. So, you know, just write a polite email goes a long way. I mean, and sometimes, and also just remember people will say no, 
or they don't have time or they won't respond to you. Um, but you know, you might get lucky and find someone who can help you give you advice or tell you something to apply for or show you a job to apply for. So yeah, you just really got to make your own opportunities. And if there's something you want to do, you know, you don't have to wait for it to become an opportunity. You can make it. I mean, you can make it, oh, my school newspaper doesn't have anyone reporting on science. Okay, well, then why don't you do it? That You know, then you can do it. You suggest doing it. Come with a plan. Say, oh, I want to write about X, Y, Z, or, you know, it call, it works in high school and college. Or you don't have a school newspaper, and you can start one. <laughs> um, you know, and that just shows that an initiative. And if then if you like, oh, I don't actually like doing this, you find out. So I think that's good. Trying out a lot of things helps you realize what you do like and what you don't like about certain fields. And that goes for science too. I think try if you can different internships and, you know, talk to different researchers before you sign on to a lab for undergrad or master's or PhD. So you can make sure you're really doing what you want to be real doing for a, a while because it takes a while to finish all that schooling. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely important. Try out a lot of things, not not just to find out what you like, but to rule out the things you don't like. That's right, yeah. huge. And I think no one ever mentions that. <laughs> there's always going to be things you don't like about your job. So don't like always try to find something better because there's always going to be downsides, you know, so just always and that's what I've learned. I think trying all these different careers, you know, working in academia and teaching and research and even policy, which I did mention I had a policy internship for two years um, and then journalism. And there's like always something that you're just like, eh, I hate this part of the job, but as long as you can get through the day, you just, it's okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> as long as you can make it through the day then you're doing well, everything I, good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's like, I mean, um, I don't wanna, if you're like really depressed, I don't wanna say like, just stick through it. But if it's like something that you're like, oh, this is like, I really just don't like the part of my job, but you know, there's, there is always downsides to every part of the job, but if it's really, really bad, then it's like, I'm not saying keep doing it, but like, I don't know. There's certain things I don't like about working in journalism, but to me, it's still the best. Shana, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it was great. It was great talking with you. We learned so much about writing and about journalism and all of the, the stuff that goes with that. So um, thank you. And uh We'll see you next time on Dr. Neurosaurus.